more autonomy in their region. You see, during the Vietnam, the talk was, if we leave, the whole thing will fall apart and they will come back to us. How many invasions took place of America by the Vietnamese after the war? None, because the problems are local. The Taliban, as was mentioned before, are fighting a local war. It is in Afghanistan, it is in Pakistan. Their interest is not to come to London. We are facing a terrible problem. I don't want to minimize it. This terrorism is an awful thing. But sadly, the more we go on the way that we are doing at the moment, the worse it is going to get. And so to drain it, first of all, as I mentioned, we have to give a real signal that they can believe in, that we have no long-term plans in their countries. Secondly, we allow them to develop their own way of government. Yeah, of course, military in all the third world countries is the guarantor. There is a saying by, attributed to Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. that dictatorship is better than anarchy. Yeah? In many of these countries, a government which can ensure that your daughter can go to school, that you can have a job, is better than total chaos. If Taliban can provide that, they will go towards Taliban. If they see that we or another government will provide that, they will go towards that. So I think the premise is wrong. You cannot have occupation and peace and stability in Afghanistan or Pakistan. How many suicide bombers were in Iraq before coalition forces went in? How many suicide bombers were in Pakistan or in Afghanistan before we went in? There really were not. Let's admit it. We have created a situation. Let's put ourselves in their place for heaven's sake. If my country, I, I've been away from Iran for 50 years, if I see that Iran is going to be invaded, I would try to fight against the invader. This is natural, you would do the same. Americans would do the same. The British would do the same. And Afghans more than anybody, they are very sensitive towards foreign domination. So really the question is wrong. First, let us admit that a lot of problem is our fault. Secondly, let's say that we don't want to propose a solution. It has to be internationalized, as we have been saying, regional countries and the UN auspices, and we will help. Let's say that America gives 10% of its military budget for Afghanistan for the next 10 years. That will do more to stabilize Afghanistan than sending another 30, 40,000 soldiers. It may be pie in the sky or it may be too naive, but I honestly think the longer we go, with this military occupation, the danger of the whole thing escalating is more than resolving the problem. Thank you, Mr. Yahanpur. I have Mr. Uh, oh, sorry, and then I have Mr. Arne Strand, and then also Mr. Gunnar Olsen. Before allowing Mr. Holger K. Nielsen to uh, give his last question, so please, Mr. Arne Strand. I'll be brief, but I think it's very important at this stage to remind ourselves that the number of the soldiers is not that important in that sense. It's the question of who are these soldiers seen as to defend. Because the way the military has been built up now, and also the police partly, it's an anti-terror military. It's one who is to combat so-called uh, those who threaten the state and international community. A lot of Afghans are asking, but why are, why are you investing in this? I haven't seen any increase in my security. And as long as Afghans don't feel that they are more secure because the military is not occupied with the kind of threats of the police that is actually affecting their daily lives, that kind of buildup of military will always be seen as a kind of both interference but also possibly a threat to the common Afghans. I'm afraid of a 400,000 Afghan army where there is no ethnic diversity within it and where there is completely dependent on external funding because then we might end up as with the military, as in Pakistan, that actually is the state, who actually dominates the states, and have very little room for either political development or for civil society. Thank you. And before returning back to Holger Kornilsen, uh, Gunnar Olsen, please. Sure, indeed. We should keep an open mind to the fact that societal institutions are evolving with our and the earth life. And uh, the most attractive and largest part of the Afghan economy is the heroin production, as known by everybody. 
leaving the more uh, up-to-date possibility than religious and military power-holding institutions that the real power-holding institution in Afghanistan nowadays to a large extent is the organized crime, which is pulling the puppets on the strings on both sides, according to every information we have about this delicate issue. Saying this also on the background of a lot of experience from Kosovo, where the international intervention ended up in a de facto independent country with no real economy of its own, but with international organized crime as an essential part of the real power structure and the real economy of that country. There is a similar danger lurking in Afghanistan when all the normal institutions are seriously damaged by so many years of civil war. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar Olsen. And the last question yeah. of questions from Holger Kornilsen. I should do it shortly. Uh, uh, because about uh, criminality. Uh, I don't think that all criminality in Afghanistan is internationally organized. Uh, there is a, a, a criminal structure there. And I think that uh, when we talk about enemies there, uh, we often talk about Taliban, but there are also uh, criminal uh, structures, uh, uh, people uh, growing uh, narcotics and, and so on. And that's what I'd like to ask. This national compromise that you are talking about, and I, I think that's the only way to going ahead in some, in some way. But uh, how is the perspective that some of the criminal organizations, they may see this as a danger of, for them to maintain their privileges? And what will they do to that? Thank you. And